Luke chapter 16, and I'm going to read verses 19 to 31. And our topic is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. A very important passage of Scripture. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in fine purple, excuse me, in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in the slain. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy life receivest good things, thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us, that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. <coughs> Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father, Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Let's end at the reading of God's holy word. <clears throat> the parable of the rich man and Lazarus is unique and crucial for a number of reasons. It is the only parable where a character in the story is named. That's highly unusual. And it is the only section of scripture which describes the mental state or thinking of an unconverted sinner in the place of torment after death. Because the name Lazarus is used, some scholars believe that the parable is based on events that actually happened. In other words, it's a historical event that Christ is relaying. Or even this was not a parable at all, but simply a historical account. Well, that we have a genuine parable is proved by the fact that Luke's introductory formula, there was a certain rich man, is the evangelist's favorite way to introduce a parable, where he, he constantly says, a certain man. It's used six out of seven times in the physician's gospel to introduce parables. Moreover, the ending of the second story, of the uh, second part of the story, verse 31, contains the classic parabolic climactic ending, where the main point or lesson is driven home by Jesus. So it contains the elements of a parable, and it has the introductory formula of a parable, and therefore 99% uh, of scholars consider it to be a parable, and indeed it is, even though it does sound like straightforward history. <clears throat> now before we examine this vivid story, there are uh, a few introductory matters that we need to consider. First, the parable, the context, the parable is connected to the preceding teaching on the unjust steward, Matt, uh, Luke 16, 1 to 13, where our Lord concludes that one cannot serve God and mammon, that is money or riches. <clears throat> After this parable, Luke notes that the Pharisees derided Jesus because they were lovers of money. Verse 14, and that word derided in Greek is extremely strong. They were, they were mocking Jesus. In response, Christ condemns the Pharisees, saying, You are those who justify yourselves before men, 
but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. That's verse 15. The Pharisees commonly displayed a spirit of covetousness, selfishness, worldliness, and a lack of love toward others. That resulted in a contemptible neglect of the poor among the covenant people. And Jesus will, is addressing that in this parable. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus will expose their hypocrisy and contempt of God's law. Remember, they're the supposed champions of the law of Moses. And Jesus repeatedly rebukes them. If you believed in Moses and the prophets, you would believe in me. You don't. And of course, I came to fulfill the law. And he opposed their teaching on the law as actually overthrowing it with human traditions. <clears throat> the rebuke implied in the parable is clearly directed to the Pharisees. And of course, you'll note at, after the parable ends, in the beginning of the next chapter, he directs his attention to the disciples, indicating he's directing this parable right at the Pharisees. <clears throat> the rich man of the parable was a lover of money who did not use his wealth in a biblical manner and thus suffered the consequences in the world to come. So that's the occasion or context. Second, this parable contains two parts with two different main lessons. In the first part of the parable, we see the results of a sinful, unbelieving attitude regarding wealth and the poor. The rich man was an unbeliever who completely ignored God's teaching in the law regarding his obligation to the poor covenant people around him. Remember, Lazarus is a godly believer who is desperately poor. By showing us what happens to the rich man and the poor man after death, we see that although the rich man was blessed and highly regarded by men, he was disgusting in God's sight. There will be a complete reversal of roles in the world to come. The next world. So this part of the parable shows us the complete foolishness of living for self, money, and possessions instead of serving Christ and his kingdom. Are you living for self? Or are you living for Christ? How you live your life reveals where your heart is. How you live your life reveals whether you have true saving faith or not. And that's the point. In the second part of the parable, our Lord teaches that unbelief and a rejection of the truth are not the result of a lack of evidence. In this case, the great sign of a resurrection. But are a result of a wicked, spiritually dead heart. And this, of course, is borne out as we'll see when we study this, Christ did amazing signs before the Pharisees and the scribes and the leaders of Israel repeatedly. And of course, right before he was arrested, not long before, Lazarus was raised from the dead. And what was their response? Do you remember? They sought to put Lazarus to death because so many people were becoming Christians, they were following Christ as a result of his resurrection. They rejected the signs, and of course, as we see in the book of Acts, they rejected the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, evidential apologetics is foolishness. It doesn't work. You could bring in evidences, that's fine, but you have to do so using presuppositional apologetics and standing on the sure foundation of Christian epistemology and the Word of God. The overall teaching of the parable is not to condemn rich, being rich while praising being poor, which is what a lot of modernists do with the parable, <clears throat> but rather to condemn rank unbelief, which exhibits itself in a life of selfishness, exhibited in a lack of concern and action for those in desperate need, especially covenant people. And then third, This parable is unlike other parables. 
where plants, persons, animals, or things are used to represent, represent spiritual truths or realities. <clears throat> we don't have symbolism in this parable. The lesson here is drawn directly from an account of what commonly occurs in real life. The only metaphorical phrase in the whole story is the expression the bosom of Abraham, which was a common Jewish way to describe heaven. It is a mistake to attempt to allegorize the characters or see hidden meanings in the text. We should take it as a straightforward history understanding there are parabolic elements in the description of hell. However, it's, it's a history. <clears throat> the related history itself, whether real or, or fictional, contains the lesson. Okay, some people think this is an actual history. This actually occurred. Some people think Christ is just giving a, a fictional story. <clears throat> what is exceptional is the pulling back of the curtain on events in the, life, in the afterlife, the life to come. It is in this description that we must keep in mind that we are dealing with a parable. While the description of the afterlife is uh, probably accurate in its main details, the ability of men in their torment in Hades to communicate with Abraham is necessary for the climax of the second part of the parable and does not mean that people in hell can have conversations with people in heaven. It's necessary to the parable. We don't want to build uh, our doctrine of heaven and hell on a parable alone. The great separation between the two places indicated in the parable itself suggests such a communication normally is impossible. So we have to understand there are parabolic elements. For example, <clears throat> he's, he's got, uh, he's described, uh, you know, dip your finger in the cold water so I can drink it. He's described as having a body. And, of course, the, some of the church fathers believe that we had a corporeal body in heaven and hell. And uh, we have to be careful formulating doctrines out of a parable. But we'll get to that when we get to it. <clears throat> and then four. In order to more easily analyze this parable, we're, we're going to divide it into three sections. We're going to look at the poor man and the rich man in this life. Verses 19 to 21. And then number two. We're going to examine their positions in the afterlife. Verses 22 to 26. And then finally we're going to consider the rich man's appeal to Abraham to go back to earth to warn his brothers and the patriarch's response in verses 27 to 31. So let's look first at the contrast in this life. Or we could say this is scene number one. The first scene of the story after the two men's, uh, the first scene of the story, <clears throat> in the first scene of the story, the two men's lifestyles or conditions on earth are contrasted. Okay, they're going to be contrasted on earth, and then in the next scene they're going to be contrasted in the afterlife. The rich man is described first, for although he is unnamed, he is really the main character of the parable. To show the Pharisees where they're going, what's happening to them, what, what they're like. To warn us of that kind of life, of that kind of lack of faith, of that kind of living. <clears throat> he is a certain rich man. Now the fact that he is identified as rich while Lazarus is poor has resulted in a number of sermons and articles on the part of modernists and left-wing so-called evangelical pastors. I don't know if you're familiar with Sojourner's magazine. It's put out by left-wing lunatics who supported Obama and Bill Clinton and are uh, totally evil and wicked, that they would support abortionists and socialists and thieves and liars. But that's, uh, that's their policy. <clears throat> they think of this as a parable on the evils of being rich. Such a view is clearly unscriptural for the patriarchs, David and Joseph of Arimathea, were very rich and were exceedingly godly. They were believers, they were godly. In fact, such a view is refuted in the parable itself because Lazarus is welcomed into heaven by Abraham, who is a filthy rich saint of the Old Testament. Abraham is exceedingly rich. The rich man did not go to hell because he was rich, but because he rejected the word of God, verse 31. He did not believe Moses and the prophets. He was an unbeliever. And his lifestyle repudiated God's holy law. 
I mean, he treated the poor man with contempt. He did not help the poor man, even though he was laying at his gate and he was a godly man. 